Welcome to the latest episode of Papal Profiles. This week, I look at the boldest and most ambitious pope in church history, Gregory VII. It was Gregory VII who initiated the Gregorian reforms that had a significant impact on subsequent European history. One of those substantial effects came via the emerging canon law collections that encoded the reforms and would be used, among other things, to regulate blood and marriage ties in later eras as the church sought to eliminate the influence of powerful landed families challenging the church's temporal power grabs. As shown in a previous video, the popes served at the whim of the Etonian Holy Roman Emperors, but that began to change drastically during the reign of the new child ruler, Henry IV, when Nicholas II became pope in 1059. Nicholas was eager to reform the election process, and so he called a synod at Easter after his election and simply declared that the emperor no longer had the right to appoint popes, but they allowed the emperor to retain the revocable privilege of confirming the choice of the cardinals. Historian Frederick Baumgartner speculates that had Henry III lived until Henry IV could project his strength, the Holy Roman Empire may have permanently succeeded in making the office of the Pope a political appointment and done away with elections altogether. Henry IV then came up against a formidable opponent in Gregory VII. Building upon the doctrine of two powers that Gelasius had formulated, Gregory went even further than his predecessors and argued for the supremacy of the papacy over secular authority. Gregory declared independence for the Vatican and for the power of the Pope over monarchs, a situation which set a pattern for the next 500 years of European church-state relations. In 1075, Gregory formulated the Dictatus Papae, or Papal Dictation, as part of the Gregorian reforms. The Dictatus consists of 27 proclamations, all of which serve Gregory's agenda and are breathtaking in their impudence as Gregory simply declared these powers for the papacy. While it is not explicitly stated in the proclamations of the Dictatus, the meaning is very clearly implied. The Pope is to be the worldwide supreme monarch to whom all temporal monarchs must submit. McCulloch writes that Gregory had all of Europe in his sights as he redefined the papacy in revolutionary terms never seen before. It was points 3, 12, and 27 that were especially relevant in the investiture controversy which dragged on from 1076 to 1122 and revolved around whether the Pope or the King had the right to appoint bishops and abbots within his kingdom. As with popes being political appointees, so too were the bishops within a monarch's domain, but which the Gregorian reforms sought to change by bringing the appointment, or investiture, of bishops under the pope's control. Centralizing power into the pope's hands not only took away a traditional right of appointment from monarchs, but also meant that bishops were seeing their independence and authority weakened. Naturally, many bishops did not submit so easily. Neither did Henry IV. Note also point number 23, which mentions Enodius, who is relevant as he is considered one of the authors of the Prosomachian forgeries whom Gregory directly references. As is plainly evident, the Dictatus is built upon a forgery of previous centuries and directly references the forged Sylvester accusatorial canon in point 19. As Henry and Gregory confronted each other over authority, Henry claimed Gregory's pontificate was illegitimate as Gregory had not sought confirmation from the king, which he should have done under the new conclave rules established by Nicholas II, and Gregory withdrew his support of Henry's rule and released the citizens of their duty to the sovereign, a power which Gregory conveniently granted to himself in point 27. During the investiture controversy that followed in the wake of this standoff, Gregory twice excommunicated Henry IV, and in a series of letters full of rhetorical righteous indignation, each deposed the other. However, Henry underestimated Gregory's support. When the German princes sided with Gregory, Henry undertook a journey of atonement in December 1076, known as the Road to Canossa, in which Gregory allegedly made Henry wait barefoot in the snow for three days before offering absolution to the penitent king. While Henry may have outwardly submitted himself to the papacy, it was primarily a diplomatic maneuver that bought him time. Henry went back to making more political appointments of church officials, earning himself yet another papal sanction in 1080. By the spring of 1081, Henry had brought his armies to Italy and besieged Rome for several years, after which he imprisoned the impudent Gregory in the Castel Sant'Angelo. Henry and the bishops who supported him elected an antipope, Clement III, who then crowned Henry 
Holy Roman Emperor in 1084. The humbled and deposed Gregory died in exile a year later after having been freed by a supporter. Thanks for watching. Please check out the other videos on my channel if history is your thing, and see you next time.